on uh, three, two, one. Uh, we are speaking with a bassist extraordinaire from Last in Line. As we say here in Montreal, Phil Soussan. Uh, bonjour, Phil. Comment allez-vous? Ça va très bien. Vous allez bien? Oui, 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 ça va très, très bien. You know, I don't normally do interviews in French. I've done one with uh, Terry Illus of, uh, formerly of Great White and, and XYZ, but... Oh, yeah. You know, it's not something that we do a lot, but... Uh, well, absolute pleasure to... Maybe we can embrace, like, some English people and some French people as well oh, with this on, kind of... Uh, on, on broken, ça tout simplement en français toute la, toute la journée. Nothing but French. But bonjour tout le monde. Nous allons parler de Ozzy toute la journée. <laughs> <laughs> That'll confuse it. But listen, we've got a lot to talk about. So I'm going to go over here because we got a list. Yes. We have got uh, the new Last in Line single. We've got your YouTube channel. We've got the um, auto, the upcoming autobiography. Uh, let's see. We've got, uh, what have we got? Uh, Please Don't Make Me Wait, which is your new single that came out yep. uh, about a month ago. So talk, let, let's start with a new single first. And here, let me get some lights back on. Uh, let's talk to you quickly about the single in terms of, is it just one single, one and done? Is it a, a solo album coming out? Uh, what was sort of the genesis of that? Yeah, it's very much a solo album coming out because as I was starting to spend some time at, at home or in the studio or whatever, uh, I had figured I'd start, I'd put work back into uh, working on another solo record. And then the reason to actually release it as a collective, as a single album, started uh, waning a little bit, especially with this song. Um, which uh, drew on its subject matter, not even intentionally, it's sort of by accident as to what was going on. I felt it was very topical and it was very uh, poignant for the moment. So I figured, well, why not just release it song by song basis? And um, so many people are doing that now. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's less and less reasons to release an album. And maybe the album can be released afterwards so I can create a nice package for the album. People who want a hard copy will be able to obtain one. And I think that would still be valid. But there, therein is the reason why I, I, I elected to start putting the songs out. And I'll probably continue doing so. I've got at least uh, two or three songs that are very close to completion now that could be released as, uh, as singles. And it'd be nice to have a little bit of video content with them as well. Well, yeah, video content is absolutely uh, crucial. I mean, I was just, b before we got started, we were going over my YouTube analytics. And I mean, compared to just doing a podcast or compared to just doing written stuff for whatever magazine people want to see mm. what's going on and 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 you know the songs are the same thing um in terms of of physical product cuz you said it would be nice for some people to have it and, and I'm a big physical product kind of guy uh how important is it for you though to have that physical representation because you know growing up in the 50s and six, not 50, 50s <laughs> the 60s and 70s and 80s we we we, we want yeah I know we wanted to touch stuff we wanted to hold stuff um yeah. You know, Alice Cooper said to me, I'd rather not own air. So do you feel the need to have to give something rather than just a well, single dropped out? Because of my history, uh, you know, things have changed, Mitch. Um, you know, we just talked about YouTube and we said uh, YouTube is important. I see YouTube as the radio station of today, the unadulterated radio station of today. And of course, you have to have some video content with it. So that's one way of thinking of things. The other thing is it pertains to a, a hard copy. Yes, of course, because of my uh, uh, background and upbringing, I cherish and I value a hard product, a hard copy product. But, you know, there is a generation of people who prefer to say, hey, just have you seen the size of my hard drive? You know, and for them, it's <laughs> that that that's really what's important is having access to the audio and the convenience of having it when they want. And may maybe there's a little bit less importance on the on the product and on the liner notes and all of that good stuff. And that does not take anything away from any any of these parties. It's just that people are passionate about different things. Some yeah. people are passionate collectors. Other people passionate listeners. Other people just want the convenience. And you know, you cater to everybody. Yeah, you you really do. I, I, I'm I'm still one that likes the whole thing. I, I like to hold on to stuff. I like to touch stuff. I like you know. Just ask my That's wife. Right. Just, ask my wife. <laughs> just yeah. ask my wife. Just ask my wife. Uh, since we talked about history here, I was going to ask you this at the end, but I'm just going to go right into it real quick because one of the bands that I like listening to is a band out in Europe called FM. And, and of course, you worked with Steve Overland uh, mm -hmm. in Wildlife and, of course, Simon Kirk of Bad Company. I mean, what a, what a great band. Uh, just, just quickly tell me the story of Shot in the Dark and how Wildlife once recorded it and then you said you, you went over to L.A. and you said, here, here, Ozzy, because that, that's a great story because... 
in a sense, Ozzy did a wildlife cover, <laughs> right? No, it was, it was an alternative version. Right. Uh, when when I was in the band, they didn't like. Uh, I mean, I brought the song to the band, and the band uh, didn't really record uh, songs they had not originated between the two of the, the two brothers. And so when the song came up, they didn't like some elements of my song, but they liked it. And they said, well, we want to rewrite some stuff. And they rewrote some lyrics and uh, made a couple of musical changes, slowed it down and stuff. Uh, and that was a derivative version that uh, we never really released it. We just cut a demo with it. Uh, after I left that band, I took that song to three or four other bands that I was in the middle and nobody was interested. Really? And then Ozzy, Ozzy was interested in, uh, in in it, and it was the original version, the pre wildlife version. And we we it went to original lyrics, uh, and then we uh, worked a little bit on some alternative uh, musical stuff. And so, you know, that's an alternative version. And you know, it's it's recently that that that's the, the this narrative that that somehow or other that was the same song. It's not the same song. It, it was a derivative version of it. So, the, the lyrics are obviously completely different, right? And uh, that was their in, that was their inclusion. Well, so I mean, in a way, they they I, I guess they they still play that song. And you know, I don't uh, I have a participation in that song. Uh, this is just a different version. And the version that everyone knows and, and you know and li and, li and listens to is that uh, different version. Yeah, well, hey, it's a. It just goes to show that your your creation was able to to transcend uh, genres and and musical whatever because it's it's a great song. Um, last in line, uh, mm -hmm. the band is going on to their third uh, album coming up. I saw you at the M three festival, and I have to say, that was an explosive set. I mean, you guys are fantastic live. Um, Thank you. Oh, just absolutely fantastic. Have you, by the way, thought of maybe doing a live album or some kind of thing where, because, you know, when you look at Kiss in the early days, the first albums came out and people went, eh, I don't get it. And then Kiss Alive comes out and people go, oh, right. And I'm not saying that people don't get last in line, but when you hear them live, you go, oh, OK, now. Uh, yeah, it's I guess we were really caught up in uh, in putting product out and doing shows and touring and traveling. And we wanted to come up to Canada so badly. And there was a possibility of doing so at some point in time. Um, we had not really thought about doing any a live recording. Uh, I mean, there are many uh, clips all over the place of us live and, and it does come across great. There was a, when we played download last year. I mean that, that the video from that, which I have is spectacular. And uh, I can see the sense in it, and I would love to to put that out. I mean, maybe that's something you know. If we if we are prevented from from uh, from doing anything uh, uh, in the near future, you know, that may be well may well be something we should talk about in terms of being able to compile something out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, um, existing footage or whatever. Existing footage, yeah. yeah. So, so talk to me about the about the upcoming third album. When do we see the next Last in Line? And you've changed labels for this third one, right? Yeah, we have. We uh, we are no longer with Frontiers, right? And uh, we are in you know sourcing another deal um, for I, I, for for whatever reason. Uh, we feel like it's maybe a it's 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 a it's a step it's a step in a, a certain direction. We were doing a lot to promote our record and, and or records, and then you know business uh, um, business requirements change between people, and uh, a certain point in time maybe the deal a, a deal is not as uh, uh, as beneficial to all the parties as as it once was. Uh, but uh, you know it's something that we're in, quite enthusiastic about I, I certainly don't want to say anything uh, um, about anybody concerned and there's nothing bad it's all good to be honest but uh, it's you know it's it's for us just it's like a it's it's like a next step for us um, you know uh, we released two albums um, both on frontiers they were both very successful and they did very very well uh, we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of, uh, you know, Frontiers has credit for that. And we have a lot of credit for that because we did a lot of our own promotion for that as well. So um, in, the, in the meantime, we've been doing material or recording material for a third record. <laughs> it's quite by accident, actually. In January, we went into a studio just to 
just just for as we say shits and grins just to cut a, a track or two uh, we're just in the same place in the, at the same time and said hey let's let's book a studio in just a couple of days we went in to cut two tracks we ended up cutting six uh, backing tracks i thought oh this is kind of cool and that's been a godsend because those six backing tracks we've been able to finish and they've come out great and we've got more than half of the record now so of course you know the one thing that benefits from live cutting of tracks is 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 a rhythm section rhythm tracks or backing tracks whatever you want to call them and vinnie's performance of course and he's a tremendous drummer he's uh, as as we know but combine that with the with the great studio sounds and great mics and, and great technique and everything we've got some killer rhythm tracks I mean, myself i was able to add the bass and, and change bass in my own time vivian of course has a set up at his house now so he's able to put his guitars down how he wants and Andrew is has his own vocal uh, set up at, at home, and we work. We all work together. We we threw files back and forth. You know, Andrew is a tremendous creative pro, uh, uh, um, um, part of this of, of this band. And we uh, we all are, and it, for us to be able to work in this kind of fashion, we've managed to make it work for us because what we have now, what we're actually extended to various different labels at the moment, is spectacular. I think. It's 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 better than the Last in Line Two album because it's a, a it's a it's a, a progress from there, but it still has that character. Let me ask you in terms of the sound because obviously Last in Line was was I guess for the lack of a better were related to the world of Dio and stuff. At some point, as you guys become a unit of four guys playing and you have these six demos and you have these six songs, do, do, can you move away from that whole history of of being sort of related to the Dio thing and, and, and get away from that sound and start having your own last in line sound or is part of it being part of the classic and giving the fans that? There's two parts to that, Mitch. Yeah. I mean, the first part I think is the character recognition. I was in the gym the other day wearing my, I don't have it on me, my last in line mask, you know, which says last in line on it just because I grabbed it to hand and somebody came up and said, oh, you're a Dio fan. And I said, well, no, we started talking. And I said, we have a band called Last in Line. Oh, yeah, I heard about you. You guys have a hologram, right? And you played Dio songs. I said, no, 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 there's a, there is a band that does that. We, we are actually an original band, but it is the original members of right, that band. It's the guys, right. So, you know, you, you have to sort of explain that and, 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 and uh, so that people can understand that this is actually a band of original music. Um, when we played Download last year, we took a bit of a risk and we said, you know what, how about we do our entire set of all our own material and no Dio songs? And that's what we did. Although I must say at the very last song we did decide to throw in, I think, Rainbow in the Dark. But we didn't know what was going to happen. And those songs were so well received. It was a really encouraging sign that uh, people do indeed like our original material. So we play shows. We have to play there are four or five or six songs that we have to play, otherwise we'll get lynched. I know you're talking to George later, but this has nothing to do with that kind yeah, of lynching. I got, I got George right <laughs> after you. Well, let me ask you this in terms yeah. also, in, you know, Vivian had a, a you know, we, we know about the falling out with Dio, yada, yada, yada. We're not going to revisit that. <clears throat> but how is it for him to play these songs? Because when I saw him at M3, and I've seen him with Def Leppard a million times, when I saw him at M3, there was an effervescence. He was like, yeah, these are mine. This is my history as well. And he seemed really excited to play these songs. Do you do you get that sense that it's like he's recapturing something or he's putting closure on? I, I don't even know how to describe but he's 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 excited. Yeah. I think he's you know, just picking up on the tail end of what I just said before, I think that this band does progress, but it does have the original DNA of Dio. And so as such, it's going to have some of that characteristic, even to the extent of Jimmy Bain, who I was a huge fan of and who was a dear friend of mine as well. And when I first joined the band, I really tried to channel Jimmy. I'd think to myself, well, what would Jimmy do? Certainly as far as playing his parts, uh, I knew what to do. But I'd also kind of, everything I did was always with respect to what, uh, what was the original chemistry. And I don't want to try to change the chemistry too much. Of course, eventually it becomes mine my own style but it's still very much influenced by that it'll be like a it'll be like an accent if i'm talking to you and i got a french accent or something it's it's got the the you know the, you you still have that dna and when viv plays with last in line and you know he's said in more times than, than than one i mean the the def leopard show is such a tightly 
uh, choreographed and rehearsed and, and has such a test of time in there. There's 25 years of perfection. And it really goes this, this way. This is how it goes. And it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, uh, show. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Def Leppard. But in this band, it's a lot more flexible. There's room to maneuver. There's room for more self-expression and improvisation. Sometimes we think, ah, you know what? We're having fun tonight and everything sounds good. Let's stretch this out. Let's do that. Let's do the other. And so that brings with it a, a separate set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what's the word, uh, cathartic mo- moments. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. Yeah, and, right. and you're right, by the way, the Def Leppard show is, is timed. I mean, I saw them three times back to back, like Montreal, Quebec and Ottawa or whatever. And like at whatever, 1042, they, <laughs> every night they finish and you went, oh, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> but it's perfect. It's a perfect, I mean, it's a great I'm, show. I'm that show. I, I absolutely love it. I've, I've been friends with Joe for, for since the early 80s. And I just, not just because of the friendship, but I actually love it as a fan. I'll go and watch them as a fan. And, you know, and uh, it's it's a great, great show. They're a great band. They they are they are a fantastic band. Uh, let, let's let's talk also about the autobiography. When does this autobiography come out? And you know, autobiography means I'm writing it. So are, are you writing it? Is it a ghost writer? Um, uh, no, I'm writing it myself. I've written it. I'm just in the process of reading and rereading and rereading and then re rechanging and readjusting. You know, I wanted to come across the right way. I mean, everybody wants to know the stories. Of course, a lot of people want dirt. That's their idea of a good autobiography. I don't really want to write dirt. I don't think there's any need to it. I think I want to make sure that everything is that I put in there. I would gladly say um, to, 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 the, to the person in person. It's really not about other people. It's about me. You know, and certainly nobody wants to hear a story of uh, stories of uh, setting the record straight or any of that nonsense either. I think that's boring. Um, and as an autobiography, there's nothing more boring than I did this, I did that, and I did the other. So with you know, in with those confines, where do you find a, po- a point of interest? And I think the point of interest is put trying to immerse the reader into into the story. Like, what was it like growing up in London during that time? What was the music like? What was the vibe like? What were the clubs like? What was the conversation like? And I've tried to make it more about that. There is some chronological fact stuff to it, of course. And, uh, and you know, there's some of the challenges and, diff- and difficulties I went through as well as some of the great moments. But I also wanted to immerse people in, you know, growing up in London in the, in the and, and trying to become a musician late 70s, early 80s and, and really what was happening. And there's a lot of humor in it. So I think it's funny as well. It's going to be good. Hopefully, uh, British humor. Where, where does that? Uh, where did your love for music come from? I mean, did you have a mom and dad that played music every day, and you said, "Oh," or, or did you see whatever the Beatles or Jimi Hendrix and go, "I got to do that"? Where Where does that come from? Saw, yeah, my mom was always a she was was always a big music fan. Always had the radio on. Uh, she had a couple of cousins who were lived in Paris who were French and. They were both musicians. They were actually musicians by by trade. They 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 became childhood musicians when their father passed away, and they had to play music to to support themselves. And their father was a musician and had taught them every instrument. And they were sneaking into clubs at twelve and fifteen years old, and they were playing and holding up their own. And they bought me a little guitar when I was about two years old. I was bought a record player. I sat there and listened to music. I, and at a very young age, I remember subscribing to a magazine in England called Words which had all the lyrics of all the current songs and I would learn lyrics and I would, you know, sing it. It happened very, very early. I mean, that, that, that's how it happened for me. And I love music. And, and uh, the, the moment that I decided I wanted to do it full time, because I was actually studying for pre-med at that time, it was a completely unlikely career, but um, it was really 1972 seeing David Bowie on uh, doing Starman on top of the pop. So I think that was the, the moment that I went, ah, that's what I wanted to do, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my parents. And anybody else who just didn't understand this guy making this, this radio, oh, 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 who is this guy dressed up all weird? I mean, this is just horrible. Um, and, you know, a young generation like, likes what their parents don't like. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, listen, my, my kid's listening to, uh, what, are, what is she, like, pop smoke and all kinds of weird stuff. That's just like, uh, what, what are we doing? <laughs> Uh, I want to ask you, you've worked with a, one with of the a... biggest mistakes you can make, Mitch, I think is not to age with your audience, yeah. you know, and if you look at someone like Sting, who's done it to perfection, people said, what's he doing, doing a jazz album for God's sake. But those people that buy his jazz albums were the same kids that were buying the police albums back in the day. 
And the worst thing that he could have done would have been to try to sort of jump onto the bandwagon of the latest teen band that was coming out because he would have faded into ridiculed obscurity, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. No, no, yeah. you have to mature with that. Um, no, speaking of frontmen, you've worked with a lot of great ones. Uh, you've worked, obviously, with Ozzy and so on. And, and Andrew's a great frontman, too. Um, talk to me about Charmed Life, this Billy Idol album that you played on, because that one's, that one's interesting to me because, you know, Billy had his band, he had his sound, and then Charmed Life comes out and it's like, oh, it got a different sound, got a different guitarist. Um, what was that like and, and how did that come about? It came about sort of by accident, really. Um, uh, the, I write quite extensively about that in the book. Um, I, I met Billy after we did a show in, uh, uh, at the KMET, which was uh, in, in, in a benefit show in uh, Los Angeles. We played it with Ozzy. And I met Billy at, at, at that show. And I'd met him before in London years and years ago. Um, and uh, purely by accident, it was when we were looking for, for a new guitar player and we had just found Zach. And uh, purely by accident, uh, we ended up, uh, Randy Castillo, the late great Randy and myself, ended up going on a vacation to Tahiti together. And on every step of this, this vacation, we kept running into Billy, who was on the same plane, he was in the same hotel, he was in the same puddle jumper plane, he was in the same destination hotel, and we were there for almost a month. And during that time, we talked and talked, and he said he was looking for a change in his band. He had felt it had gone as far as it, you know, as he felt comfortable with it, and wanted something different, he wanted a new guitar player, wanted to try start from new with a whole different uh, attitude, and he wanted originally Randy and myself to play in his band, um, which we eventually got together. Um, we started doing Randy for, for whatever reason, um, did not work the way that, uh, it, it was hoped to have worked. Nothing, nothing to do with Randy at all. Uh, and so, uh, we then looked for another drummer. Randy went back to Ozzy and I don't think Ozzy even knew he'd, he'd even temporarily left. But um, we put the band together, started working with this whole new new project. Uh, a very interesting note is when I started out in music, you know, I grew up in Maida Vale in London, and that's where all the punk bands started, The Clash and and Generation, Generation X and, uh, you know, Kilburn and the High Roads and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the London SS and all of those bands. And I knew, I was aware that I was about four years too young for that. And I, it was the music of my, my, 17s and 18 years, 16 and 17 years old. And so I wanted to be involved in something like that. And for ages, I, I, I met a drummer who was the original drummer in Generation X, John Tao, and he was trying to get me into bands. And I just kind of missed the boat on that. Uh, we, I did work a lot with John and uh, he eventually went to work with Adam and the Ants and what have you. And then so many years later, the opportunity for me to work with Billy Idol was fulfilling something I'd wanted to do when I was 15 years old or 16 years old and had missed the boat on. That's why I did that. Nobody understood why I left Ozzy to go work with Billy, but that's why. Yeah. And I did not Ozzy, by the way. You know? Well, yeah, well, that's, a, that's a whole other story, right? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I left, and Billy was right there. We talked about this while I was still in Ozzy, and it had been going back and forth. So when, you know, I was just unable to cut a deal with Sharon that, that we were all happy with, no no animosity or anything. It was literally a negotiation to, 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 to work on the next record. And I just was not unable to cut a deal I was happy with. And she was not happy to accommodate what I wanted. And it got to a point where one day I just said, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, sidestep at this point and, and move on and move in a different direction. And uh, that's what happened. I went straight into work with Billy. I called Billy up and said, let's do it. Yeah. Well, mate, listen, as a, as a Billy fan, I was more of a Billy fan then than Aussie fan. Now I'm a fan of both equally. Mm. But I mean, you know. How, how are you going to complain? It's 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 a, it's a great lateral move, parallel move, or whatever you want to call it, you know? Absolutely. I, I, I approve. Uh, just before I run out of time, because i got George Lynch, as we said, uh, we've got two more things that I want to cover, and then maybe some other more. Uh, you've got the Phil Susan YouTube page, which, of course, you're showing techniques, you're you're, you're doing base, I don't want to say clinics, but your you're, you're, you're technique. Uh, talk to me about that and what inspired you to sort of connect with the fans on that level where you just want to sort of say, hey, this is how I did this. This is how I do that. Here's my new song. Here's, And just have that sort of personal visual connection with them. I, I love teaching. Yeah. I really do. I think I learn more about my craft when I'm teaching than when, I, than when I'm performing my craft myself. I find it, it it's, it's really fun and enjoyable. And I thought that I had the idea to start experimenting, putting some of these videos out there to see 
you know, what the response was like, as it happens, I'm going to start doing that much more extensively in collaboration with a particular company. I'm just working out the details right now. So there's going to be much more of that stuff. And uh, it's very worthwhile. Um, so that's really the YouTube page. I want people to subscribe to the YouTube page. There's all kinds of stuff. There's uh, music. I got to check here. Hold on. Am I subscribed? Oh, no, I'm not. Look at that. All right, I'm going to click it right now. There we go. You now have uh, 621 subscribers. Yes. And we're going to get that. Much. We're going to get that higher by the end of this. There you go. It's a fairly new thing. So I think it's a it's I'm encouraging people to subscribe. And then there's diverse stuff. I put stupid cooking shows up there. <laughs> I put how to fix your refrigerator up there. And, you know, it's just really funny. But um, there's yeah, the accent is really going to be uh, on, on, on stuff which is useful to people. I'll put my singles up there, of course, but I will also put some educational stuff for people who want it. And yeah. then, uh, you know, you know I, I came up with this concept on Instagram when this whole pandemic started, which is called uh, COVID Kitchen, the 59 second gourmet. So I love cooking. I've been on TV cooking. I've, I've been on shows cooking and stuff. And I had a restaurant and what have you. And so uh, I started uh, Instagram would limit you to one minute. So I would try to condense a cooking show in 59 seconds. Hence the 59 second gourmet. The, 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 the 59 second gourmet. Now, just quickly, uh, since you mentioned having a restaurant, most people that have restaurants, it's just a lot of hard work for not a lot of great return. How how how, how challenging was that for you? Was And what kind was it? Was it a French restaurant? Was it Italian? What was it? Oh, it was not. It was a very authentic Japanese restaurant. Oh, wow. Very won a lot of awards in in Los Angeles. It, it won, uh, Zagat called it better than Nobu. I mean, it was oh, incredible. Wow. Fantastic chef by the name of Go Nakabayashi. He was a executive chef for uh, another great restaurant in town. And it was killer. It was really a, a passion of mine. We did very authentic Japanese, very traditionally aged and everything else, but uh, very little in the way of like rolls with sauces or anything like that. Um, it was beautiful. It was called Kaiju Sushi. Uh, it's still there, but it got sold. I had partners, and then the partners decided, for whatever reason, that they wanted to a sale. I was out on the road, kind of got railroaded into a sale, which I was heartbroken about at the time. But the chef and I decided we'd you know, live to play another day. But I got to tell you, right now, I'm kind of glad I'm not involved in the restaurant business at the mo this moment in time. I mean, it would be very, very difficult, wouldn't it? Uh, I mean, yeah. as it is, it's really tough to run a restaurant. I know a lot about be stramatics if that's the right word yeah. but uh, the econ economics of running a restaurant it's it's brutal i mean you 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 run a nine percent margin and all of a sudden some regulator comes down and says you're gonna have to raise everybody's uh, uh, salaries by 40 percent and you're like how you know difficult to do well i, I don't know about in in california but in, in quebec or montreal they say that 80 percent of new restaurants close after oh, yeah. a year or two so it's just like I don't know how you do it. And then, of course, like you said, they, 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 you know, this minimum wage, this and this, that. And, and it's like, well, what about us? You know, and, you know, we're, we're having a debate over here with Skip the Dishes and Uber Eats where they're taking 30 to 40 percent. And the restaurants are going, we Can't don't survive. have that 30 <laughs> percent, you know, you know, and right now what we're doing with restaurants that are open, you know, I have a house in Los Angeles, but I have a house in Las Vegas as well. And I'm living in Vegas, which is somewhat open. But we go to restaurants and we're trying to give them. Even for takeout, we're trying to give them bigger tips because they're trying to they're trying to run and stay alive on a minimal salary, and all we can do to help them is 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 is, is priceless for these people. You know, these they, I feel so bad for the restaurant business, and they're such a an essential part of uh, of people's uh, social lives. I mean, it's, it's it's this is what we do. We go out to restaurants, we have great meals, yeah. business meals, fun meals, birthday meals. Yeah. You know, it's just I would just hate to see those uh, them suffer. Yeah, well, uh, well, they are suffering, and and it's I don't know what what it's going to be like in one or two years from now. But if this keeps going, it's yeah. Anyway, it's it's a bit très difficile, as we say. Um, let me quickly ask you because we I'm, 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 pardon me. Ça va sans dire. <laughs> ça, oh, ça, ça va sans uh, The last in line here, because and, and I subscribe to the last in line uh, YouTube. But you've got a new video out, a new single, an acoustic single. Yeah. Um, talk to me about that and, and putting that out. And is that, the, is that something that's going to be on the, on the, on an album? Is that just here fans enjoy is, is, what is it? It's purely for our fans. It's just a little bit of a, a gratitude. Thank you. Not just for our fans, for the venues, for the staff at those venues. It's a, it's a tribute to, 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 to the memories of touring, of, of being on the road 
to other bands, but it's primarily... By the way, for... you just said the memories of touring. Let, let's, hopefully we're not at that point where we have memories of touring. We want new memories. It's like... We do. Yeah. we do, but I'll tell you what, it seems like, I mean, the last gig we did was in Florida in February, and it feels like it was a decade ago. I mean, it, it's that's that perception is just awful. But um, we wanted to just do something and put something out for the holidays for our fans, and so this is what we remember. This was... This is what we remember of our interactions together. And also that we're going to be doing this again very, very soon. You know, I hope so. Um, I hope that we get to find ourselves in the, in the same room together, you know, fans and bands alike, uh, do, enjoying what we, we love doing. And without fans, we're nothing. And uh, presumably without us, uh, we, they, 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 they find themselves, you know, missing something as well. But together we're whole. Um, I, I and, fully agree with that. I mean, it. I, the last show I saw was in March, and it, it's just like, well, what do I do? Like, I go to show. I mean, I go to three shows a week. It's like, what? Well, well, now what? So yeah, there's yeah. a there's a there's a big void, and you know, uh, there's the live stream stuff, and you know, it's cute, but it's not a live show. It's not. Yeah. Really. <laughs> no, we're not, and we don't. We're not selling the. We're not selling the song. It's not for sale. Uh, you can't buy it. Uh, it's just the video. We would love people to go to our YouTube channel and watch it and subscribe to it. That's all we ask in return. Just watch it and enjoy it. And now it's for you. Um, uh, but uh, it's not a it's not a, a venture to make any money. If people do want to spend money, though, they can go to our website and they can buy merchandise. They which we're, not, we're, we're unashamedly, unashamedly, unabashedly, <laughs> unabashedly selling. But that's that's really not the motivation. The motivation is to do something nice for our fans, and we get the greatest fans in the world. They're so they write to us all the time. They're cool. And this, that was the same subject as, of course, of Please Don't Make Me Wait, my song, you know, which uh, which is really about the whole COVID shutdown. And, you know, my, my dear friend Richie Carson offered to play the solo on it. He heard it and said, I'll play a solo on this. And I said, yeah, it'd be great. Sent it to him and he did that. So yeah. uh, people seem to like the song. Yeah, Richie's great. And and uh, I'll, I'll go back to where I started with you before is, you have to see Last in Line live. I mean, I bought the albums, and I love the albums. I had them in my playlist, and I had them in my phone, and the whole thing. But then I saw you live, and it was just like, ah, okay. And it's just, it, <laughs> it, it, it just brings you to that next level. How and people say that? It's it's really strange. They all say, I, you know, I thought it was a great idea, but once I saw the band, it that's it. It's yeah, and, and and it almost sounds insulting to say that, but it, it really is not. It it just it's just it just live. It just whoa. You just Okay, you know, and it's, it's it's not meant to, to say that the albums are not good. The albums are great, but live, it's such an experience. But, I, you know, listen, when you've got Viv there, you've got you, you've got guys who have done it for so many years, they understand what a fan wants to see, and you delivered. At M3, you delivered. Like, totally <laughs> delivered. Totally delivered. Anyway, I've got to... Uh, I've got to go interview George Lynch, but this is always, always a pleasure. I'm, hopefully we can do this again, and we can get into some of the history, and we can get into some of the other stuff, but... Uh, there you go. Uh, toujours un plaisir. Oh, thank you very much. And likewise, Mitch. Really appreciate this. It's great to talk to you. Yes. And speak to you. And uh, look forward to seeing you again very soon. Yeah. I hope you can Canada soon. I really do want to this, this all opens up. Well, if you need help getting up here, I, I, I know the right people. So just okay. let, <laughs> let me know. Merci, Hello, monsieur. Okay. À la prochaine. Merci. Cheers. Bye-bye.